Welcome to Coffee and Prayer. You can see on my cup, thou art the potter, referring to God, and you and I are the clay. The third Sunday of Lent, welcome. Let's open our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. reading presents the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. 
For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien residents in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Word of God, word of life. There's glory to God's law of Psalm 19. To the leader, a psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heaven, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than any honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Word of God, word of life. Our epistle is First Corinthians. 1 18 through 25 for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of power of god for it is written i will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning i would what where is the one who is the wise where is the scribe where is the debater of this age has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the word did not know, God thought through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we will proclaim Christ crucified and stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can
the gospel for this, the third Sunday of Lent, is found in the gospel according to St. John, the second chapter, verses 13 to 22. We call this Jesus cleansing the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 40 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Amen. <laughs> word of God, word of life, and thanks be to God. Well, I recommend you take a really big swig of your coffee or tea, Put on your thinking cap and fasten your seatbelt because we've got some tough things coming up in the next couple of minutes. We are going to think about law. Law. You uh, heard the Ten Commandments a couple of minutes ago, right? We call that God's law. Our Jewish friends remind us that God's law fits within the Exodus story. They call it Torah. When Martin Luther wrote his small catechism, the first section is God's law, the Ten Commandments. You've got them all memorized, right? Well, if you don't, now's a good time. Law is a very complicated thing to think about. So the first thing we notice is that God gave our ancient Hebrew ancestors two things. Liberation from slavery in Egypt. That was a gift. And then comes the law. <laughs> a second gift. Once you are free from slavery then God's law becomes a gift that tells us how we want to live our lives so that we have personal integrity and that our society holds together with justice and fairness and compassion. Law glues the society together. Where do we get the law? Well, one place is the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Another place is Jesus, right? Jesus sums up the law as love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So we love God, we love our neighbor, we love ourselves. That's the law. <laughs> the law. Oh, there's another source for law. Reason. Reason. Remember, Jesus gave us the golden rule, Matthew chapter 7, that's towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, well, you do to others what you want them to do to you, and you don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. 
Yep, Jesus gave us the golden rule, but he's not the only one. You can find the golden rule in other religions, and Martin Luther says the golden rule makes good sense. It's rational. So you and I are enjoined by God to use our noggins to think through what laws are going to be just, fair, conducive to compassion, equality, and peace in society. Well, um, let's make it more complicated. <laughs> so we have these three sources for law, right? Uh, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. We have the teachings of Jesus, and we have good old-fashioned reasoning. Now, and it's all the same law, by the way. It's just one law. It all comes from God. Now Martin Luther makes it more complicated because he says there are three uses of the one law. One law, three uses. There's a political use, there's a spiritual use, and there's a guidance use. Maybe you had better take another sip of coffee because, oh my gosh, this is going to be tough. Are you ready? <laughs> the political use. One law, political use. Uh, Luther, you know, spoke Latin. German wasn't good enough for him. Well, I'm only kidding. He liked German too. This is called the usus politicus or the usus civilis, the civil use or the political use. When a society organizes itself around law and order, that's when you get justice and you get fairness, you get peace. And the Ten Commandments were supposed to do that for the nation of Israel. You and I today in our societies, it's a little more complicated. The Ten Commandments might be the core, but we want our legislatures to use their noggins in order to pass very specific laws that are just and fair and conducive to peace and order. And if we think those laws are unfair, what do we do? We become an activist and we say, change those laws. So they're more fair and more just. Well, where does that come from? That comes from you and my conscience. So the political use of the law isn't just what governments do. No, no. It's also you're in my conscience. So one of the reasons we memorize the Ten Commandments is we want to form our conscience around God's law. We want to form the conscience to conform to God's law, and then it becomes automatic <laughs> that we love God, love our neighbor, and uh, love ourselves. Okay, that's the law in the first use, the political use or the civil use. Second use, are you ready? Maybe another cup of that coffee, because the second one's going to get even more complicated than the first one. The second use of the one law, according to Martin Luther, is the spiritual use, or the pedagogical use, or the theological use. <laughs> usus spiritualis, usus pedagogicus, or usus theologicus. Now, have you ever had a guilty conscience? Have you ever said, oops, I... I broke the law. I, I sacrificed my integrity. Or I have not loved my neighbor as myself. In fact, I perpetrated an injustice. And now I'm really feeling badly about this. Guilty. Ashamed. Well, if you felt that way, then God's law is working in the second use. It condemns us. It judges us. It provides a measure, and you and I fall short 
of that measure. And when we realize that in our heart and in our soul, most of the time we lie, right? Uh, that's where hypoc hypocrites come from. They want to pretend that they didn't break the law. They want to pretend that their conscience is, uh, dis is not disrupted. But if you allow your conscience to get disrupted, if you feel guilty, that means the law is doing its work in the second use. And that's why when we come to church on Sunday, most Sundays we stop to confess our sins. We want to be honest. We want to be realistic. And we recognize that guilt and shame, mm -hmm, second use of God's law. Well, then, what good is that? Well, that makes us ready for the gospel. The gospel is the story of Jesus told with its significance, and the significance is this. God forgives you and my sins. Free of charge. It's a gift. On the one hand, we confess our sin as having disobeyed the law. On the other hand, God announces, look, forgiveness. Eternal life, free gifts. The law and the gospel kind of fit together like hands and gloves, right? So that's the law in the second use. Okay, so now you and I are pronounced forgiven by God's grace. But that law is still important, right? Love God, love neighbor, love self. How are we going to do it? Well, the Ten Commandments are an awfully good guide. And when you interpret the commandments positively, you know, they're worded negatively. Thou shalt not murder, for example. A positive interpretation is I should show compassion and care for my neighbor so that his or her life flourishes. Ten Commandments, God's law. A good guide. Well, what's the bottom line? I think we're about ready to finish. You can have one more cup of coffee, uh, sip of coffee. Before you go to bed tonight, say a little prayer and include in that prayer the following line. I am a forgiven sinner. Hooray! Please join me in the prayers of intercession. The Lord be with you. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy, O God. Guide our church, that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. And you could say your mercy is great out loud. The heavens declare your glory, O God. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, 
and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray now for all those in need, for those suffering for the faith, for those who are poor, hungry, and homeless, for those who are sick and those awaiting death, and for those in the cross and crown family. We're remembering particularly Bob, Lynn, RJB, Therese, Linda, Scott, Linda, Dutch, Charles, and Richard. Now as we think about those needing long-term healing, we're thinking about Joanne, Carol, Gabe, Chris, Mark. Ed, Sawyer, those homebound, Ruth, Pastor Leon, and Norma. Oh God, you are the healer of our every ill. Hear us, oh God, your mercy is great. Receive our thanks for all who have died in the faith and bring us at the final resurrection into your everlasting life where sorrows will be no more. Into your gracious and mighty hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. It's time for communion. If you haven't brought your bread or wafer or wine or wine substitute, you can get that now. So I will remind us of the words of institution, then we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll consume the bread and the wine. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you, and do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, join me in praying the Lord's, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
body of Christ given for you and me. The blood of Christ shed for you and me. Now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and preserve you now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you.